Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 3111, little video on the book of John Mandeville, which I, as I mentioned in class the other day, is an enormously popular compilation of various medieval travel, lore, and literature, which is brought together under the pseudonymous authorship of someone named John Mandeville, who takes all this material and turns it into more or less a first-person narrative, pretending that he's seen all these things, traveling all the way from England all the way to Java, basically, and also into Africa. What we have here is an illustration of the Cynocephaly. I'll talk about them on the next slide. I'll just say that this work, which is originally written in French, was translated into many, many languages, into Middle English, of course, which we're going to be reading one of the many translations into Middle English, into German, into Latin, into other languages, and that Columbus himself had a copy of it when he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. And it was read continuously by non-scholars, at least through to the end of the 18th century, who believed various stories in it. So what's going to happen in book 13 that you read for today? Well, you're going to encounter a lot of things. One is a wish-granting woman who will grant you any wish, but if you wish to sleep with her, you will find a lot of trouble. There are the Amazons, which naturally enough is a story that follows after the wish-granting woman. We have various so-called Plinian people. This is from a Roman writer named Pliny, who described all the various strange kind of people or even monsters who lived very far away in foreign countries. We have the Sciopods, so-called shadow feet, because they have one giant foot that they use as kind of an umbrella on hot days. We have the Cyclops, who have one eye in the center of their forehead. Here they are, illustrated in a 1481 German print translation of the Book of John Mandeville. We have the Blemmy, that habet nun head in her ear, beth in her shoulders, who have not no head at all, have no head, and their eyes are in their shoulders, here they are, in that German translation, and her mouth in her breast, and their mouth in their breast, in their chest, and so their mouth is down here, where we might have our clavicles. We have the uh, cynocephaly, that is the so-called dog heads, kinos, it's Greek, having to do with dog, uh, and cephalus, having to do with heads, so men and women that been that hath hundes heads, and they've been reasonable. They are reasonable. Men and women who have hounds' heads, and they are reasonable. That is, they are basically human beings with the heads of dogs. We have, of course, India and a long description of its diamonds, which seem to be kind of sentient in a way. We have various kinds of people, especially naked people and cannibals. And you start to get a sense of what this book is all about, especially once you leave behind the Holy Land, which is a section we're not reading in this class. Once you get out of the Holy Land, it becomes a compilation of wonders, of strange things. And so we can ask what would motivate someone not only to write this, but also motivate someone to read it. And we know evidently it's hugely popular. So it's not just because it's weird. People really want to seek this stuff out. Why? Um, we have a description of actually existing wealthy places like Java, which is hugely wealthy at the time and hugely populous as it still is. And uh, if you get the PowerPoint, you can click through for a very interesting discussion by an expert on medieval Indonesia who has written about the account in Mandeville and how it corresponds to what we know about actually existing Indonesia in the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, we have a long description of divergent burial customs. So he doesn't describe people who bury their dead because that's what he does in his own customs. But we find a lot of different ways of dealing with human corpses, of uh, wife burning, of husband burning. You'll see the wives are burned. If they don't have children, they don't have a choice in the matter. Husbands do have a choice whether they're going to be burned. We have uh, the sick who are hanged in trees by some cultures. We have other cultures that feed the dead to dogs and many cultures that seem to eat the dead. Dead. He's very, very interested in stories of what we often call cannibals, or we might better call uh, anthropophagy, the people who eat people or the eating of people. We have a long discussion of idols versus simulacra. Idols, he says, are human shaped and simulacra are animal shaped. He doesn't really maintain that distinction. And we also have uh, strange forms of what seems like Christianity, which, as I will talk about in a later slide, and also an aberration, in some cases, for religions that are clearly not Christianity, but which seem to be equally devout. So the Sinocephaly say prayers as we say Ura Pater Noster and Ave Maria. They say prayers as we say our, uh, our Father who, are, who is in heaven or our Hail Mary. So 
we also have a description of the roundness of the earth. It is commonly believed, even into the 21st century, that medieval people thought the earth was flat. They did not. There were maybe two people in written witnesses who said that it was flat, uh, one of whom was judged to be a heretic, uh, and one whose work was written in Greek and is pretty obscure and wasn't translated into Latin even until like 1705. So medieval people said over and over again that the earth is round, which of course it is. Um, it was in English, it, we can blame the widespread misconception on Washington Irving, who wrote a book about Columbus and tried to show how brave Columbus was by having hit, by claiming that other people believe the earth was flat. That's just incorrect. And it really takes off uh, this misconception from like 1870 to 1920, as we see a period when there's a real um, rhetorical assault on traditional religion and saying science is superior, et cetera, et cetera, which many of us maybe believe, but um, it ends up misrepresenting the actual beliefs of medieval Catholics uh, in order to make that argument. Uh, this is all discussed in a book uh, by Jeffrey Burton Russell in 1991 uh, about the myth of the flat earth and about the myth of the myth of the flat earth. So uh, Mandeville is one of many, is not unusual in saying that the earth is round. And he's getting this from works like, um, there's a book called uh, On the Spheres by Jean of Sacrobosco. And well, we can also look at a work like uh, Walter of Metz's Image of the World, uh, the Venerable Bede much earlier, they all talk about the roundness of the earth. And this is an image from a manuscript of Walter of Metz, uh, which is says here in French, uh, homme qui va en tour le monde, a man who is going around the world. And so they, he, these two people sit out in opposite directions and they meet each other on the other side of the world. And so I'm gonna read this Middle English to you and I'll talk about a few of the interesting elements of it that will, I, I hope, help you read the considerable text for this weekend. And therefore he have he thought many times of the tala that he heard when he was young, who a worthy man of our country was to team to save the world. And he passed Ind in these ills beyond Inda, where beth more than five thousand. And he went as so long beyond, and be say saying about the world, and he found an ill where he heard his own speech, and dreaming this, saying such words as men did in his own country, of which he had great marail, for he wist not who that meet be. But he say he had he go so long in that land, and say, going about the world, that he was he come into his own emerges. But for he meet have no passage further, he turn in as he come, and so he had a great, great travail. So I've uh, highlighted a few of the words that maybe will give you some difficulty. E is, of course, just the first person singular pronoun. I, e thought, uh, is one of many instances, ego, ecom, that are one of the Middle English ways of making a past tense. So, ethrocht is just, I thought. Uh, ecom, I came. Ego, I went, and so on. So, that little prefix, y, functions like the modern English ed at the end of a verb. So, it just makes it into a past tense. Beth is, of course, the verb b plus the f ending, which is used in the south of England. So, B plus F equals Beth. You'll see that on the next slide as well. Wenda, we can translate as wandering or traveling. Uh, wander, of course, in modern English. Seeing, uh, seeing, like to see things. So you're going to see that a word like that very often. It just means such, saying such words as men did in his own country. Wist is a word you'll see very often. And uh, that gives us the modern English word wit. But uh, probably the closest version to that is the German word uh, wissen, which means to know. Um, so he did not know how that might be. Um, and then travail, uh, labor or effort. And so he had a great labor or effort. Uh, the French travail, which is a word for work, is, is that closest version of that word we have now. Um, so what does this mean? It means that there was a man who traveled all the way around the world and uh, did not realize that he had circ uh, circumvented, circumnavigated, circumambulated rather, the world until he heard people speaking in his own language. And what's additionally interesting, it's really not until he heard people driving beasts saying such words as men did in his own country. And he had great marvel for he did not know how that might be. And C. David Benson's note 
pointed out something that I was also interesting to me, which is that we don't talk to uh, the oxes that we're driving to, to do our plows. We generally don't say words in English to them if we're doing that. We say uh, words like ye yeehaw, sui, and so on. They're nonsense words, but it's interesting. They're not words that you learn in school. They're not words that we count really as English. And it's interesting to me that the words that really strike home the fact that he's gone around, all the way around home and he's back in familiar territory are words that are really not a human language at all. And maybe we can talk a little bit in class about what's going on with that and why that's the example. <laughs> and then one more thing to talk about. Um, it's the uh, Shrine of St. Thomas. So Thomas is one of the original 12 apostles uh, who served Jesus in the Christian scriptures, which the Christians call the New Testament. And Thomas legendarily travels to India, where he is uh, uh, preaches the gospel in India and is eventually martyred. So the legendary stories of the apostles is that they all, uh, almost all of them, die for their faith in various places. Um, and Thomas dies in India. And indeed, there are very ancient shrines to Thomas in India. In fact, in Chennai is one of the places where you can find them. Um, and so Mandeville, drawing on various material, mostly from Odoric of Portanone, missionary into Central Asia, is describing the Shrine of St. Thomas. And then he talks about the idols that are inside the Shrine of St. Thomas. And you start to wonder, is this Christianity or not? What is he talking about? What is this faith? And what he's describing is something that modern English people call the juggernaut. And it's from a shrine in India called the Jagadath. I'm, I don't know how to say that word, but that's how I'm saying it right now. People can correct me in comments if they like. And here is a description of that particular uh, idol This is in the shrine. And before this chara go first in procession, all the maidens of that country, two and two together. And after him go pilgrims that Bethy come from better countries of which pilgrims some follow dune before that chair and let the well is go over him, and so they beth did, and some hath there her arms and shoulders to broke. And this doth they for love her idol, that they should have the more joy. So first off, let me just tell you what this image is. This is an illustration of the shrine of St. Thomas. He talks about the relic of St. Thomas, his arm, the actual arm of the actual apostle, which people consult is a kind of oracle and a the arm will point in certain directions depending on the question that's being asked of it. And so that's an illustration of it. This, I did a spot check of several manuscripts of, of uh, the book of John Mandeville. This is the most common illustration of the scene. They tend not to illustrate the uh, the juggernaut, the chariot, the massive idol that's on a, on a cart that's dragged through the streets and people supposedly legendarily throw themselves underneath it to be crushed and cut themselves with knives to show their devotion. Now, um, to talk a little bit about the Middle English, here again are some features of it. Hem, again, is the, the them, the southern form of the pronoun. So you can even see some have their, their arms and shoulders. So in modern English, we would spell that T-H-E-R-E, T-H-E-I-R. Middle English here in the south have their her armus. We have Beth, Goth, and Doth, which are all verbs with the eth ending of the South. So this is consistently a Southern dialect of English, that eth ending. So B plus eth equals Beth. Go plus eth equals Goth. Do plus eth equals Doth. We have Chera, which is a chariot or a cart, modern English chair. To broke, which just means broken. Maidenus, maidens, that is virgins, people who have not had sex, supposedly very pure. And first first. So a lot of this, again, if you read it out loud, it's going to be much, much easier to understand. It will still be difficult because we're early in the semester, but you'll find that it's easier to understand. So what's going on here? Um, probably in historical, the historical situation, we may have some kind of ritual self-torture involved around this shrine. People do such things, and they do such things worldwide to show their devotion to various figures. So that's not inconceivable. The throwing yourself deliberately to death strikes me as more radical and very hard to conceive as an actual thing that people are doing. So I've read around in some Indian writers on this, and they say that we're talk probably talking about a very large crowd, or because of the crowds, occasionally people accidentally fall over and get crushed by the wheels of this giant idol that's being drawn through the streets. That feels likely. That feels like the 
practical explanation of what is actually happening here. That is, however, in the 19th century when the story is really retold by the English as they are conquering and colonizing India, um, they see this as an example of Indian religious frenzy, and they probably use it as an instance to justify the fact that they, they that the Indians are not allowed to rule themselves. They say, "Look at these people; they're so barbaric. Look at the kind of things they did, and they they we can't allow them to rule themselves." That's not how it's functioning here with Mandeville. Mandeville, I think, is using a story like this to say, look how intensely religious these people are. Look at their fervor. And in some manuscripts of this, there's even an additional sentence that says, if only Christians had this kind of devotion and piety. So we can talk about that in class as well as this kind of compilation of really intense stories in order to tell us how it is that maybe we fall short of the ideal of our own faith. Um, so this is not a, exactly an account of horror. It's an account of grandeur or admiration or even awe in front of this. So I'm looking forward to our conversation on Monday and thanks for sticking with me.